Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. Church of the Nazarene. So at this time, we're just going to have them just share the word and share their story and their testimony and what God has laid upon their hearts in the world of the missions. Amen. Amen. Good evening, church. <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, Pastor, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I just want you to know how much I enjoy the praise and worship music. Um, just feeling the spirit of the Lord. So thank you all. I'm blessed. Well, Dad and I always think it's good for you to know a little bit more about your missionaries. Dad and I are graduates of Southern Nazarene University. Please don't hold that against us. We, we know there are lots of other great schools out there. I think there's one that starts with an O that's probably pretty near and dear to everybody's heart. But Dad and I graduated degrees in business and accounting and finance, and we, we went out in the corporate world, and we were just kind of doing our thing. But we loved our church. You're probably not surprised that Diane was a greeter, if you got a chance to meet her. And uh, I got the privilege of actually singing in the praise team. Well, in 2000, God called us to Benita Park, which is one of our Nazarene camp and conference centers in the beautiful mountains of Rio de New Mexico. We had over 100 volunteers, and we served over 13,000 guests a year. So think kids camp and teen camp and women's retreats and men's retreats and, and family camp. It was a great time. And then in 2008, God called us to one of the most frightening, scariest places in the entire world. Olathe, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where Don and I served with Jesus Film Harvest Partners which is not some rogue organization. It's actually the arm of the Church of the Nazarene that works with the Jesus Film Ministry. And we spent 10 wonderful years in Kansas City before he sent us to probably one of the most frightening, scariest places in the entire world, which was Bangladesh. Now, if you don't know where Bangladesh is, you probably know where India is, so find India in your mind on the map and just take a hard right. 169 million people, that's half the population of the United States, lives in Bangladesh. And we all lived in this space about the size of Iowa. Okay? So I want you to get a sense of what this felt like for us. Number one, there were two seasons, hot and hotter. It was just hot all the time. And for all those millions of people, there was at least I'm going to say 100 million mosquitoes for every one of those people. There's a lot of mosquitoes. Dirty, dusty roads, hardly any sidewalks, no stop signs, no stop lights. And I want you to imagine thousands of rickshaws just kind of running around the city, you know, this kind of organized chaos. And probably one of Don and I's favorite things was. They really loved the horn. I mean, they loved it. And it was kind of like this old language. You'd be like, Hong Kong, I'm coming up behind you. Hong Kong, I, I see you, I see you. Hong Kong, I'm right beside you. Oh, I see you, I see you, Hong Kong. 
I'm now in front of you. I'm not you. Hong Kong, I see. Have a nice day. I mean, there was a lot going on. But it was an amazing place. A rich place for Dao and I get to serve. So I don't know if you can see these pictures very well, but this is actually the street we lived on. And, and on any given day, you would see young people like this walking down the street with all their wares. Like this, this particular one had the cookware, and he had it stacked pretty high. And they would just walk down the street, and they would yell whatever it is they were selling. And you would just kind of come out to the balcony and look and see if you wanted that. We had families who were walking to the mosques on Fridays because this is a highly Muslim country. We had five calls to prayer every single day. And uh, you also might see that even day the vegetable carts that would come in from the villages, or maybe the live chickens. Um, Don and I are city folks. We didn't grow up on the farm. Maybe some of you did, but for us it was a little bit of a mental thing because Live chickens means you gotta kill chickens, which means you gotta pluck the chickens, which means then you gotta eat the chickens. That's hard to believe, right? But yeah, that's kind of the space that we lived in. Well, where are we now? We are serving still on the Eurasia region, but we're in the regional office in a little bitty village of about 1,500 people called Busingen, Germany. Diane serves as our NMI regional coordinator and I'm the Jesus film guy. Which means that tonight you're going to get to hear from me, at least, a lot of Jesus film stuff, so I hope that's okay. Well, globally, we have over 1,100 Jesus film teams. And on the Eurasia region alone, we have over 217 of those Jesus film teams. And they're made up of locals and nationals who speak the language, they know the culture. They can do it, we cannot. Now I want to be careful here because in the old days, our GSM teams used to show the film on reel to reel. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Where are my young people? <laughs> Usually I have a few young people and they just look at me like, reel to reel, I do not know what that is. But you know what it is, right? I mean, the projector weighed like 50. Pounds. It took three or four canisters of film that weighed 10 to 15 pounds a piece just to show the film. We had to have a generator for power. We had to have fuel. We had to have a big screen. We had to have a big sound system. It was a lot. It was about 100 to 150 pounds of equipment we had to carry. And it took five to seven people on a team to make all that happen. Well, we've come a long way, right? We've gone from reel to reel. VHS, to DVD, to SD cards, to micro SD cards, and now we're using these little LED projectors. Look at that thing. It'll last for 20 to 30,000 hours before it has to be replaced. And it's got a little slot here so that I can use a micro SD card or a thumb drive where I can load all kinds of content. Now you probably know about the Jesus film. It's over two hours long. It's great. It's wonderful. But we also have a story of Jesus for children. I think I like that one a little better. Maybe it speaks to my heart, but it's only 62 minutes long. And then we have one called Magdalena. We have one called Rivka, which reminds women that they have value, that they have worth. We're also using anime and cartoons and veggie tales, all kinds of stuff to tell people about Jesus. Well, a projector needs a few other things, right? So we've got this giant amplifier. So for my sound people, they would appreciate that. They would look at that and say, that is pretty amazing. And then we've got to have um, an awesome sound system. And once again, my sound people would be like, that is not the best stuff, Rusty. You're right, this is not the best stuff, but it's the loudest stuff. And it's called a horn speaker. And of course, the idea is that we will get it up in a tree or somewhere up high and just kind of project that sound out. Imagine it being loud enough for five to three people. Okay. Well, then you got to have a microphone. We always have to have a microphone because in the middle of these GSM showings, it's not like we just 
show up, turn the film on, everybody watches it for two hours, and then go home. They will raise their hands right in the middle. And we're like, okay, I see that hand. They will turn the film off and we'll go, what's your question? I want to know a little bit more about Jesus, guys. See, he's doing these healings and things. Can he do that for me? Yes, he can do that for you. Turn the film back on. And more questions come. So you always have to have a microphone. And you got to have a way to power all this stuff. So look at this tiny little lithium ion battery here. You love to carry that in your purse. <laughs> but it lasts for about six to eight hours before it has to be charged up. Now, I'm in a lot of different places in the world, and sometimes I can find a place to plug it in and charge it up. But a lot of other times I'm not. So sometimes I'm on a motorcycle and, and I'll just kind of uh, rig the wire up so I can charge it as I'm going down the road. But if I can't do that, then what I'll do is I'll pull out the solar panel. And I'll just hang this solar panel on the back of the backpack as I'm going down the road, I can actually charge up the battery. That's pretty neat, right? And all that stuff fits in this backpack and it only weighs about 20, 25 pounds. We like to say that uh, we're kind of the Jane Bond of ministry, right? The kind of, what we do is kind of this Mission Impossible stuff, but it's true. <coughs> That's kind of the high-tech stuff, and then we have the low-tech stuff. My wife's pointing because she wants me to show off this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's like the, well, not the last last day. He changed it on me. I got a point. I, I shake it up. Okay. So the low tech stuff, I, I'm sure many of you have seen these things. The Evangel Cube, right? I love the Evangel Cube. You know, it simply and clearly unfolds the gospel. And I've used this in lots of different places. And you can be walking down that dirt road and, and doing that. And people will begin to gather around and begin to go, what? that you have you say I have life's greatest treasure right here inside this cube can I tell you about it or we have the evangelism soccer ball most of the world calls this football but we're using the five colors from the wordless book to tell people about Jesus so very quickly dark color represents sin we're all born in sin uh, all born in sin separated from God he loved us so much he sent his son, he died on the cross, spilled his blood. Because of that, our sins are washed as white as snow. And then we have the gold color, which means now we need to have this relationship with God. I think about heaven and beauty and majesty. And then the green color is, with a, is a new creation, a new heart. I'm called to pray and to read my Bible and to spend time with other believers. And the last thing is to, to tell others about Jesus. All that from this five colors. And then we have the Bible story cloth, which has 50 beautiful pictures from the New Testament and 50 from the Old Testament. And I like to think that if Jesus was here, he would probably say, why don't you point to one of these pictures and let me just tell you a story, right? He was great for that. So I love the Bible story cloth and all of these kind of morality tools, the low tech stuff. And now all fits in this backpack as well. So what Diane and I tripped her up on was, so that would be all I would share with you about the equipment. But we just finished up General Assembly, right? Did anybody get to go to General Assembly? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. Well, as you know, there's a lot of people from around the world, which means it's a great time for us to bring in a bunch of equipment. And I'm talking about hundreds of pieces of equipment, because then we get to send it back to all those little corners of the world. It's also another great time for us to introduce new tech. So I want you to forget everything I just talked about, because this is too much, this is too heavy. Things are getting lighter and brighter and easier to carry. So now, see, Indiana is one of the first ones to see this. This is a big deal. 
<laughs> so this is the new set of equipment. And I think it's going to be probably less than 10 pounds. So everything I need is right here. Projector, battery, amplifier, if I speaker, way more than any of this. Now, if I need more, it'll let me hook up microphones and other speakers, but I probably won't need it. And you notice something else, there's no cables. The biggest thing that breaks on all this stuff is the cables. Because we got this plugged into that and that plugged into this, and they just wear out. There's no nothing here. So I just kind of show up, find a, a tree stump or something, and just set it on that. Isn't that amazing? So I'm excited that we got a chance to, to show that to you, to share that with you. Well, I hope you can see this picture. So there are places in the world today that you would be surprised we can no longer really do outdoor Jesus film showings. Or one of those places is India. We think India is this safe place. It's a democratic society. Everything from our side looks like it's supposed to be, but it's not really. They want to create a one religion. They want everyone to fall in under that one religion. You can be a Christian if you want to be, but you've got to stamp your ID card that you are a Christian which means that you're probably not going to be able to get a job. It means your kids are probably not going to be able to get an education. They kicked all the missionaries out of India. They kicked compassion out of India. They, they've done everything they can to push back against Christianity. You probably didn't know that about India. So now, we're spending a lot of time showing the Jesus film, telling people about Jesus inside. And that's okay. But look at this. I love this picture because... There's probably 30 to 50 people. You can't see them all. It's jammed into this small space. So it'd be like, okay, guys, pile up into the closet behind the church, right here behind the podium, and uh, we're going to watch the Jesus film for two hours. And our dear brother there, they're using tablets and they're using their cell phones. So he just pulled out his cell phone. That's kind of a tiny little picture, right? And he pushed the play and pushed the volume up as high as he could. And look, they are watching. They are listening because they get to hear Jesus in their heart language. So praise the Lord for that. Yes. I, I always wonder with my dear brother, did his arm ever get tired? I mean, like he's holding that out there. And um, probably not. Probably not. His faithfulness. Well, every month, our Jesus film team send in a a story or a testimony about what's going on. And earlier I said there's over 1,100 teams. That means there's over 1,100 of these stories and testimonies. So tonight I thought I would share with you or read some of these to you. I'm thinking 378 tonight. Yeah. <laughs> How about one really good story, okay? There's always lots of stories. But I want to share with the story about Pastor Lord. So Pastor Lawrence gets arrested on a Saturday showing the Jesus film. Happens. Happens a lot. And the police keep him in custody over the weekend because the courts are closed. And it's not until the following week that they can do anything about it. And so the following week, he gets taken to a, a place that they call a, a medical review board. Now right away that tells me something happened. Between the time he was arrested until this moment that they are taking a look at him. I don't know how badly he was injured or abused, but something's not right. After he completes the medical review, they send him to the police station. Where the chief of police sees him and has compassion on him. And he realizes that Pastor Lawrence is a pastor. And he probably won't create any trouble. So... I believe the Holy Spirit is moving. And he invites Pastor Lawrence into his office. He says, Pastor, sit. Rest. Let me, let me turn on the air conditioning. Let me get you a cold drink of water. That, that, that does not happen. 
And after some time, the uh, officer says, okay, Pastor Williams, I now need to put you in the jail with the other prisoners. Okay. So he takes him back, puts him in the jail, locks the door, and steps away. So Pastor Lawrence is crying out, and he's praying out loud, and, and in the middle of all that, these other prisoners kind of see what's going on, and they decide, you know, I, I think I need some of that. So they kind of cozy up to Pastor Lawrence, and they say, Pastor Lawrence, would you pray for me? Of course. Well, now there's way more commotion happening, and the police and the officer, they come back in, and they see what's going on, and they decide... They need to spend a little time with Pastor Lawrence and bring their petitions to him. And so we have this jail full of prisoners and officers and Pastor Lawrence, and he's just praying for them. Isn't that amazing? Well, obviously God's working, and so within a few days he's released. All the charges are dropped. And that in itself would be a praise the Lord moment. But Pastor Lawrence decides a few days later that he feels God kind of tugging him to go back to that jail, back to that prison, and start a prison ministry to begin praying with other prisoners and other officers. And I think, who does that? I read that story and I think about this other guy in our Bible. I'm trying to remember what his name was. So Starts with a P. Paul, Paul, that's his name, Paul, right? And I mean, this is like a modern day Paul. So it reminds me that those stories and things we read in our Bible, and we think, oh, that happened so many thousands of years ago, right? That's not really real. That doesn't happen today. It does happen today, church. So pray for Pastor Lawrence. Well, I want to give you a little scripture tonight, just briefly. Matthew 13, 8, I'm sure you know this very well. But it says, still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So God uses a film from the 1970s that's been translated into over 2,000 different languages. And 40% of the people who hear the gospel make a decision for Christ. Praise the Lord. But it's not just about showing a film. Jesus still ministry is a prayerful journey as we work to clearly present the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people. We want to develop passionate disciples for Christ. We want to see fruit that remains. We want to see it all done in strong and healthy local churches. And we believe baptism is just an important part of the story. So on this next slide, if you had it working, this would come on and you would hear people clapping and singing and the video would kind of move around and you would see all of the hundreds of people that have come for this baptism service. Yeah. Yeah. So my challenge to you tonight is, you know, would you walk 1.25 miles just to be a part of a baptism service? Knowing that if you do that, all those millions of people in those countries see you, they hear you, they know what you're doing, they know you've made a profession of faith, that could be trouble. That could be a problem. And I love this picture of just this mile-long group of family and friends as they're going out to see these individuals get baptized. And on this particular day, it was 23 people. And I'm like, wow, I mean, I, I'm excited. But every week, Diane and I get texts and emails. And so on this particular week, I got the text and said, hey, Brother Rusty, I want you to know 23 people got baptized. I'm like, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. The very next day, I get another text. Hey, Brother Rusty, um, you know, we, we just didn't have enough time the day before. Uh, so we baptized another 50 today. I'm like, another fifth today. Yeah. And usually that's not where it ends because the very next day I get another text and I go, Brother Rusty, I, 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 I don't know what's happening, but there's another 75 that we baptized. And I'm like, oh my goodness, the Lord is working. 
And I just praise him for that. Well, as a church, we collect a lot of data, right? And those numbers represent lives that are changed. So we start with just on the Eurasia region. Every four minutes, somebody makes a decision for Christ through the Jesus name. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how many minutes have we been together? So think about that. So what does this mean? It means last year we celebrate over 139,000 people coming to Christ. And of those, 103,000 are now involved in some kind of discipleship. So what's next? People always want to know, okay, Rusty, I'm excited about all of this, and what's going on, but what's next? Well, we're starting a new two-year set of discipleship lessons called the 108. It's being designed for literate and non-literate learners, which means we're, we're doing some oral training, we're, we're translating material, we're printing material, we're actually pushing it into an app for those literate learners. We're rolling out a training for lay men and women who are leading all of these new baby churches or small groups that we're starting. And we're wanting to expand work to the East Med field. And when you think about the East Med field, we're talking about Lebanon and Jordan and Israel and then other countries where they're classified creative access. We can't talk about them. They're places where you could lose your life talking about Jesus. And we're trying to figure out how to do something with this little box right here. This is called the light screen. And if I were to turn this box on, all of your phones would go off. <laughs> that's a little unnerving, right? But this creates a Wi-Fi hotspot that's not connected to the cloud, it's not connected to the internet, it is safe and secure. And I can load all kinds of content on this device and then push that content. So I wonder what kind of things we would load. Hmm. Maybe the Jesus film, right? Maybe the Bible in a, in a written form or an oral form. Maybe some discipleship material or how about even some pastoral education. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to use this to tell others about Jesus. And we're inviting lay men and women and young people to be a part of this. So please pray with us about how we might use this. Well, I've asked Diane to invite her to come up, and she's just going to share a few more things with you and just kind of close our time together. for 15 years now, and this is the official definition that comes out of the handbook. And so it starts out, a Christ-like disciple set apart by the Holy Spirit. Wow, when I heard that, I'm like, that's too much. I can't do all that. It's just, then I thought, wait a minute. I've been a Christian. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was six years old. Okay, well, I've been studying and learning, be growing in my walk, and I had the Holy Spirit when I accepted Christ. Check, I'm already a Christ-like disciple. Woo, thank you, God. Then, prayerfully sent out by the church. You know what? I'm positive your pastor prayerfully sends you out of this church every Sunday to go out into your community and to be Christ to the people around you. Now, where it gets to be a little different as far as the official missionary title, affirmed by Nazarene missions to cross-cultural barriers... For the purpose of spreading spiritual holiness. 
And I thought, why wouldn't they say like cross-cultural work or ministries? Why did they say barriers? Well, what happens when you become a missionary to another country is you have to set yourself aside. And it's really not that hard because when you go to another country, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you can't drive on the side of the road that you're used to driving on, the food is different. You are completely outside of your comfort zone. And when we lived in Bangladesh, the only way to survive was to have a lot of Jesus. And I needed a lot of Jesus there. And it wasn't because the people were terrible or anything like that. It was just so different. It was so hot for one thing. The mosquitoes were really, um, they were challenging, almost more emotionally than physically. The people were lovely. Lovely, lovely people. We didn't live on the rich side of town, which was the embassy side. We lived where the real people lived. We were the only white people, and I thought of myself as their token white person. So, you know, to have a, a person of Western uh, culture live in their community actually elevated them. It made them feel important and special. Within the Church of the Nazarene, we have a Nazarene church there. Uh, it, well, actually, hundreds of Nazarene churches in Bangladesh. And so where we lived, there was a Nazarene church in the same building. And to have the global church say Bangladesh is so important that we're going to send missionaries there, it really elevated who they saw themselves as, as part of our body of Christ. So it was really important. We had the honor of being the first missionaries to ever go to Bangladesh to the Church of the Nazarene and live there. So that's really kind of what it means to be a missionary. And we want to say thank you for letting us be your missionaries. And we certainly have followed God for many years in obedience. And I want you to know our God is able. He invites us to be part of his story. And what a wonderful compliment that he would want us. Because you see, he doesn't need our time. He doesn't need our talent. He doesn't even need our money. You know, I know, the missionary said that. But what he desires from us is obedience and relationship with him. That's really all he wants from us. But how do you live out your obedience? You guys are living it out tonight by showing up for church. <clears throat> Thank you. Your physical presence makes a difference. It makes a difference in the global body of Christ because there are other new churches around the world gathering right now, too. And they're coming together under the Nazarene umbrella, but ultimately it's under the body of Christ. So your presence makes a difference. Do you know how many park their cars out here? A little hard to see on this church parking lot because people driving by may not know you're here. Your presence in this community makes a difference. This church building, if it weren't here, people would know something's wrong. Why isn't that church open? What's, what's not happening there? So when they see people driving in and coming this way, they know something's going on. And you know what the truth is? They want it. They want whatever it is. They just don't know what it is yet. So thank you for your physical presence. Yeah. Another way that you can demonstrate your obedience is with your finances. And God talks to each of us differently about that. In the beginning, Rusty and I worked in the corporate world and made good money. And we were so involved in our church. Truth we didn't think anything about it. I mean, we gave our time, our talent, and our money because we love our church. And then when God called us into ministry at the Nazarene campground, we thought this will just be a short-term thing because we'll go back to the corporate world. Nope. Then he called us to be missionaries. He really surprised us with that one. But when we were in the church, we did all the things that we felt like the Lord wanted us to do. And then when we were no longer officially lay people, we were like, whoa, we were pretty good. I mean, you know, not to brag, but just that, um, just the honor of getting to serve the Lord. But I want you to know, when you give to your local church, you're making a really good investment. If your thing is rural health care, if your thing is clean water, educating children, providing compassionate ministries, ending human trafficking, indigenous church planting, saving souls, growing disciples, your church does all of those things well. And when you invest in your local church, you're investing in the global body, and all the churches around are doing the same thing. Pitch it in a little bit. 
Then what we do is we take a little of that and we handle the administrative part of being a church. You know, we have to comply with government regulations here in the U.S. and every country in which we work. We have to have people that coordinate trainings and missions and missionaries and health care benefits and salaries and paychecks and all the stuff that happens when you're running a business. But you see, because we're doing that as the global body, we're paying for all that for everything we do. Compassionate Ministries doesn't have to pay for that. Jesus Film doesn't pay extra for that. Missions doesn't pay extra for that. Alabaster, when you give to Alabaster, 100% of those funds go directly to the field because we have these other funds that are covering all of it, constantly making that happen. So what I want you to know, you're making a good investment. It doesn't matter how much you're investing, time, talent, resources, all of it is a good investment. So thank you guys for the investment. Now another way that you can demonstrate your obedience is through prayer. And I bet you guys have prayed for your missionaries. Do I see my head shaking? Okay, good, that makes me feel better. You know, you don't really know us, you don't know what you're praying for necessarily, but those prayers count. I really feel like the Lord hears those prayers and goes, oh, Diane needs some extra today. We're gonna, we're gonna cover her with a little extra prayer today, even though, even though that church has never met her, we're gonna send some her way. So all of those prayers count and make a difference. So we invite you to be one of our prayer partners. And you know, most people do, whoa, that was exciting. <laughs> most, most people do a postcard, well not us, we do a whole sheet of paper. Because I have on here a little bit of information about us. Rusty, for instance, is a third generation Nazarene. I think that's a really big deal. Well, I was a bus kid. My parents did not know the church. Amen. Yeah. And look where I am now. Don't you know that bus driver's going, I drove her. Look at her now. I never thought she'd make it that far. But I was a bus kid. Now, I have no idea how the Lord used my life. But one of my favorite little facts on here comes from Carla Sunberg. She's one of our six general superintendents because you see in the Church of the Nazarene we're all about accountability. And that's why we want to be part of the denomination. You want accountability because we need it to each other and our organization needs it. So we have a, a church board, we have a district advisory board, we have a regional leadership, and our general superintendents, there's six of them. So not one person runs our church. We're doing it together. Sometimes we do it slow but we go further together. So Carla Sundberg said, the Church of the Nazarene is in more countries than, here's a little drum roll in my mind, McDonald's. <laughs> Can you believe that? I couldn't. So I, I fact checked her. I made, I'm like, are you sure about that Carla Sundberg? <laughs> yeah, can you believe that? How cool is that? I mean, I would think that's probably one of the most, um, uh, well-known organizations in the world, in the Church of Nazarene in more countries than the big for-profit organization. So that's the kind of facts that we have on here. We have some prayer requests. We have our email if you want to contact us, our blog listings and websites. But my very favorite part, the last third of the page is the partner part. This is where you can give me your name and email address. And at the very bottom, the good part is, Please pray for me about. We would like to know how we can pray for you. Because we don't feel like it's a one-way street where we just take your prayers. We want to be in relationship with you, and this is one little way that we can do it. So we've prayed for um, children who are making bad decisions, unsafe loved ones, health issues, job situations, financial issues. That's what we want to do. So we want to pray with you about these. And so we have these pieces of paper out on the table with the yellow suitcase. You can tear off the uh, last third and just drop it in there and we'll add you to our prayer list. So on that table out there, I call it the world market. And my husband remembered that I left this in the card. Thank you for going to get it here. The world market didn't start on purpose. When we lived in Bangladesh, we had the opportunity to go out into villages where you don't have restaurants and you eat with your hands. Uh, that's just some of the highlights. But one of the others is we met a man, and his father was saved because of the Jesus film. This young man is now on the Jesus film team himself and pastoring a local church. 
He also took us to see his father's grave. So his father had passed away, but before doing so, he gave land to the church of the Nazarene for the church. Now, this lady, his mom, was a widow. How does she earn a living? Well, we found out that she makes baskets. I would have never asked to buy one because I'm sure she had some clothing that she had to make. And she was in a little village, so it's not like she was selling them herself on the side of the road. And they said, no way, you can have one of these baskets. We're like, oh, we would love one. How much do they need to pay? And we're thinking, we're going to bless this lady, you know? That's what we're thinking. And so we find out the price of this basket. By the way, this weed is only done in her village. And, you know, I'm thinking, boy, if I got this at Hobby Lobby, it would be $40. Of course, I would use the coupon. But, you know. So we're just thinking, oh, this would be great. We can bless her. And then she said to us, it's one hundred taka. We were overwhelmed by that. Because, you see, one hundred taka is one dollar and 25 cents. And we said, could we pay 1,000 taka, which is probably about 12, 13 dollars. She said, no, 100 taka is a fair price. So what she taught me was, her dignity was the part that was important. She made a product and she was selling it for a fair price. So what happened is I started looking for other people who were trying to earn a living to keep themselves and the, their children out of harm or out of situations that might compromise them in lots of different ways. So I started buying stuff because I found out that my one dollar could be somebody else's week's salary. I bought keychains and magnets. I mean, some of the things were handmade, some weren't. And honestly, I didn't need them. Most of the time, I didn't want them. But what I wanted to do was invest in that person's dignity. And I met a couple of young girls in Goa, India, and they worked in a market. And the stuff they made was uh, sold was not handmade. But you know what? They were young teens, 16, 17, earning a living by using this technique. So I bought several things for them. I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and that was an amazing thing for God. I met the people from Bethlehem that made their ornaments out of scrap pieces of olive wood that others would have thrown away because they were earning a living. And I got those from this lady who goes and buys them. So she, kind of like me, buys this stuff, not knowing what she's going to do with it, but she wants to invest in them. So I saw what I had in my little, I called it a gift closet. It was just too much to even give away. So now it's a world market. It's out there on the table. If you guys want something, you take it. It doesn't matter to me because it's God's stuff anyway, right? Now there is a box there. I call it God's Adventure Fund. And basically it just refuels my ability to, to buy stuff whenever I see someone that needs a little, little encouragement. So that's out there. But don't worry about the price because there's not a price on stuff. And if you ask me, I won't tell you because it's priceless. <laughs> but ultimately, we want you to know you really make a difference. To us personally, we could not serve if it weren't for every small church in the Church of the Nazarene that comes together and invests in God's work. So thank you so much for letting us be with you this evening. And I think maybe if you guys want to, after we wrap up, we will be around for questions and you're welcome to come to us with any questions that you might have. Pastor, that's all I've got. <laughs> amen, amen. Isn't it so good to have them here in the house of the Lord here tonight? Amen. You've heard their story, you've heard their testimony, you've heard how God is working and moving in another part of the world. And so at this time, what I would like to do is we would like to take a, a love offering um, for them and to be able to help them in their mission. And so what I'd like to do is I need to have a couple volunteers to have as ushers here tonight. And we're going to just take an offering for them here tonight. So... 
Let's bow our heads and let's just uh, open up our thoughts and what the Lord would have us to give here tonight, okay? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather here tonight in the house of the Lord. So good to hear of the wonderful things you're doing in Eurasia and in that region, Father, with uh, Rusty and Diane Robbins and specifically just the Jesus film as well and all of the other tools and all the other things that, Lord, just go into all of the ways that we can present the gospel. And so, Lord, we're a grateful people here tonight. And so, Father, what I'm asking is that you open up our hearts, Lord, to be able to give to these causes here tonight, Lord. Will you be able to speak to us on uh, a way that we can just uh, help fulfill this mission, Father, uh, through these uh, offerings? And we just ask that you just bless this time here tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.